Welcome to CNU, the video series that will teach you everything you need to know to provide excellent nutrition care. In this video, I am going to cover feeding tubes. By the end of the video, you should be able to identify the types of feeding tubes that can be used, know advantages and disadvantages of short-term feeding tubes, and know advantages and disadvantages of long-term feeding tubes. If you find this video helpful, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Let's get started. Once it is determined that a patient will benefit from enteral nutrition, you need to figure out how it is going to be delivered. When doing this, there are two questions that must be addressed. One, how long is the patient expected to require enteral nutrition? And number two, where will the end of the feeding tube be placed? Time is important because there are feeding tubes that are best for short-term feeding, and there are others that are best for long-term feeding. In this context, short-term is generally considered to be anything that is less than six weeks, while long-term is considered to be anything that is more than six weeks. This is an approximation more than it is a hard and fast rule. With short-term feeding, the primary point of entry for the tube is the nose or the mouth. With long-term feeding, the primary point of entry is the abdomen. Using this information, we can begin to build a flow chart. The short-term feeding tubes can be guided into the stomach or small intestine, and this is what will ultimately determine the name of the tube. Each name is a combination of the point of entry and the location of the end of the tube. For the nose, we use naso. For the mouth, we use oro. And for the stomach, we use gastric. So, if the tube is inserted through the nose and ends in the stomach, it is a nasogastric tube, or NG tube. If the tube is inserted through the mouth and ends in the stomach, it is an orogastric tube, or OG tube. Short-term feeding tubes can also be guided into the small intestine. These may be labeled as intestinal or postpyloric, but usually the name is more specific to the section of the small intestine they end in. If the tube ends in the duodenum, it is a duodenal tube. And if the tube ends in the jejunum, it is a jejunal tube. So, if the tube is inserted through the nose and ends in the duodenum, it is a nasoduodenal tube, or ND tube. And if the tube is inserted through the nose and ends in the jejunum, it is a nasojejunal tube, or NJ tube. The same concept can be applied to a tube inserted through the mouth. The end of feeding tubes are never positioned in the ileum or colon because it is beyond where most nutrients are absorbed. Nasogastric tubes and orogastric tubes are the most common, and this is because they have three distinct advantages over the others. First, feeding into the stomach most closely aligns with the normal digestive process by allowing the stomach to serve as a reservoir where the formula mixes with gastric juices before being gradually released into the small intestine. Second, gastric tubes are easily placed at the bedside by a nurse, dietitian, physician, or physician's assistant. Surgery and sedation are not required. This means there is lower risk of complications and a shorter time from decision to place to actual placement which reduces delays in feeding. Third, a gastric tube can be used as a trial tube to assess tolerance to enteral nutrition. If gastric feeding is poorly tolerated, you can always advance the tube into the small intestine to assess tolerance there. Also, if the patient ends up needing enteral nutrition for a prolonged period, you can give it through the short-term feeding tube until a long-term feeding tube can be placed. Compared to nasogastric and orogastric tube, the postpyloric feeding tubes are more difficult to place. They require a highly trained staff member, 
which is either a seasoned clinician who can advance the tube from the stomach to the small intestine without the use of advanced technology, or a specialized physician who advances the tube using imaging tools like an endoscope or fluoroscope. Since there are fewer clinicians who can complete the task, positioning the feeding tube in the small intestine may not happen in a timely manner and can therefore lead to a delay in feeding. Another point I want to make about postpyloric tubes is that positioning in the duodenum is the least common. This is because it increases the risk of the tube migrating into the stomach, which defeats the purpose of the intestinal tube. It can also lead to contents of the small intestine, like bile and pancreatic enzymes, getting regurgitated into the stomach where they are not meant to be. The final points I will make here are the disadvantages of the short-term feeding tubes. All of these tubes can irritate the nose, mouth, and throat, leading to significant discomfort and or skin breakdown. They are also easily dislodged, both intentionally by the patient and unintentionally. Losing enteral access due to dislodgement can lead to delays in feeding and will be time-consuming for staff who have to replace the tube. With this, we can add the short-term feeding tubes to the flowchart. When a tube is inserted through the nose or mouth, it can be gastric or intestinal. Then it is named by a combination of the place it is inserted with the location where it ends. On to the long-term feeding tubes. Just like the short-term feeding tubes, Long-term feeding tubes can be guided into the stomach or small intestine. A major difference, however, is with how they are named. Instead of being a combination of the point of entry and the location of the end of the tube, long-term feeding tubes are generally referred to by the location of the end of the tube and the word ostomy. An ostomy is when an opening from an area inside the body to the outside is created and how we end up with the gastrostomy and jejunostomy, also known as the G-tube and the J-tube. My review of the literature has led me to believe there are some circumstances that have led to the placement of a long-term feeding tube in the duodenum. However, in practice, it is increasingly rare due to the previously mentioned disadvantages of positioning the tube there. A gastrostomy or jejunostomy can be further classified by the procedure used to place it. There are three categories for this. They are percutaneous endoscopic, which means through the skin with assistance from an endoscope. This is usually performed by a gastroenterologist. Then we have percutaneous radiologic, which means through the skin with assistance from radiological imaging. This is performed by an interventional radiologist. Finally, we have surgical. This can be an open surgery or laparoscopic, with the former being more invasive than the latter. Putting this together, we get the percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy, also known as the PEG, percutaneous radiologic gastrostomy, also known as PRG, and open or laparoscopic gastrostomy, which may just be referred to as G-tube. Then we get the percutaneous endoscopic jejunostomy, also known as PEG, percutaneous radiologic jejunostomy, also known as PRJ, and open or laparoscopic jejunostomy, which may just be referred to as J-tube. One last feeding tube I will mention here is the gastrojejunostomy. This is when the tube is inserted into the stomach but ends in the jejunum and is often referred to as the GJ tube, PEG-J, or jet PEG, which stands for jejunal extension through a PEG. Here is an example of what a G tube can look like. One of the major advantages of a long-term feeding tube is that it can improve the quality of life for the patient. The patient will not get the irritation to the nose, mouth, and throat that can occur with the nasogastric or orogastric tube. 
This increases overall comfort and decreases the risk of skin breakdown to these areas. Also, if the patient has the capacity to eat any amount of food by mouth, the long-term feeding tube will allow for more comfort during this activity. Another advantage to consider, especially for patients who are awake, alert, and active, is that a long-term feeding tube can be hidden from view, which can lead to an increase in self-confidence in public. This is particularly true with a low-profile tube. Nevertheless, long-term feeding tubes do have some disadvantages. For one, The placement of a long-term feeding tube is more invasive than a short-term feeding tube since the abdominal wall must be penetrated. For this reason, there is a higher risk of complications during placement and this is related to both the actual procedure and any sedation that is used. A long-term feeding tube also carries a long-term risk for infection and or skin breakdown at the insertion site, which can occur from poor hygiene, leakage of gastric contents, pulling on the tube, or an improper fit. With this, we can add the long-term feeding tubes to the flowchart. When a tube is inserted through the abdomen, it can be a gastrostomy, jejunostomy, or gastrojejunostomy. These can be labeled as G-tube, J-tube, and G-J-tube. We can further specify the name of the long-term feeding tube by referring to the procedure used to place it. The three procedures are percutaneous endoscopic, percutaneous radiologic, and surgical, which can be open or laparoscopic. Here is a summary for this lesson. When it comes to selecting a feeding tube, There are two questions that must be addressed. One, how long is the patient expected to require enteral nutrition? And two, where will the end of the feeding tube be placed? This is because we have short-term feeding tubes, which are meant to be used for less than six weeks, and long-term feeding tubes, which are meant to be used for more than six weeks. With these, we can feed into the stomach or small intestine. The short-term feeding tubes are named by combining the point of entry with the location of the end of the tube. Examples include the nasogastric tube, orogastric tube, and nasojejunal tube. The nasogastric tube and orogastric tube are the most common and are considered advantageous because they follow the normal digestive process and are easily placed at the bedside. They can also be used as a trial tube to see if a post-pyloric tube or long-term feeding tube is needed. A disadvantage of all short-term feeding tubes is they irritate the nose, mouth, and throat and can therefore lead to significant discomfort and or skin breakdown. Another disadvantage of short-term feeding tubes is that they are easily dislodged by the patient, both intentionally and unintentionally, leading to delays in feeding and the use of valuable time. The long-term feeding tubes are often named by combining the procedure, the location of the end of the tube, and the word ostomy. Examples include the percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy, or PEG, and the percutaneous radiologic jejunostomy, or PRJ. Another relevant long-term feeding tube is the gastrojejunostomy, or GJ tube. A major advantage of long-term feeding tubes is they can improve the quality of life for the patient. This can be related to an increase in comfort since the nose, mouth, and throat will not be irritated. It can also lead to an improved ability to eat if that activity is feasible, and hiding the tube from view can increase self-confidence in public. A disadvantage is that placing a long-term feeding tube is much more invasive than a short-term feeding tube, leading to increased risk of complications from the procedure or sedation. There is also long-term risk of infection and or skin breakdown at the insertion site. Thank you for watching.
Check out these videos for more content just like this.